Okay, there we go. Welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on uh, and attending this morning's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Uh, please let me know if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. You can send those to me in the chat. Uh, and otherwise, you can send any questions or comments you have through the Q&A button. Um, we will have closed captioning enabled for this event. Um, however, if you find it distracting, you can press the more button and click disable live transcript. It may be somewhere else on, it, it changes depending on what uh, Zoom client you're using or what device you're using rather. This program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Chef Trisha perez Camille. Trisha is the owner of the Inn at Hastings Park here in Lexington, where she's cooking from today and has been creating cooking instructional videos on their Instagram during the pandemic as well as hosting our cooking series. Um, Trisha will be back on April 2nd and you can sign up on carrylibrary.org. So now please welcome Trisha. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back. Um, today we're going to be celebrating the heritage of one side of my family. Um, I have the honor of having married into a very, very large Irish clan. And Ireland actually has a very special place in my heart because it's actually the first place that my husband and I visited. It was the first trip that my husband and I took together and it's really a magical place. It also was supposed to be where uh, we go on vacation every summer and we've been trying to take the kids to see some different European destinations. And this past summer, we actually were supposed to go to Ireland. Um, that was supposed to be our summer vacation. So hopefully um, in the not so distant future, we will be able to do that. So here in Boston, we're lucky to have a large Irish community. And what I have actually learned over the course of the last few years is that, you know, there's still some traditions that are rooted in sort of the area around Dublin. And then there are other traditions that are rooted in the British side. My glove broke, there you go. Um, and so St. Patrick's Day, you know, it is celebrated in Dublin. It's not necessarily as big of a holiday across Ireland as it is here, um, for what I would refer to as the Irish diaspora. So growing up here in the United States, there are certain dishes that I think that we've come to associate with the celebration of St. Patrick. And St. Patrick um, is the patron saint of Ireland. He is known for having driven the snakes out of Ireland. Um, I did have the opportunity to hike Crowpatrick when I was there. Um, it's very beautiful. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it to the top because I have a, a little known secret or maybe not, a no, not that big of a secret. I'm terrified of heights. And the last part of that climb is very, very steep. Mike made it to the top and I had to wait a little bit further down because I just couldn't overcome my fear to get to the top. But nevertheless, it's a beautiful vista of the Irish countryside. So what we're going to do today is we are going to make an Irish soda bread and then I'm also going to share with you my version of corned beef. What we're going to start off with is the corned beef recipe. And I actually used a cooking technology that until recently was only available in restaurants. And that is um, sous vide, which means to cook under pressure. And the whole concept behind it is that you vacuum seal whatever it is that you're cooking and you cook it in a hot water bath that maintains a constant temperature. And the way that hot water bath retains that constant temperature is we use something that's called an immersion circulator. And it basically is a machine that warms up the water and keeps it at the same temperature throughout the cooking time. And what that means is that the product that you're cooking maintains its temperature throughout. So what I did last night is I vacuum sealed the corned beef with cabbage and potatoes and I cooked it at a, a temperature of 180 degrees for about 10 hours. If you don't have a sous vide, what you could do is you, would, you could either boil the, um, the corned beef or you could cook it in an aluminum foil covered pan in the oven at 350 degrees with a cup of water. And as I said, I would have it sealed. Um, I would have it sealed in aluminum foil. So what you can see is I have cooked this piece of brisket 
Um, I bought this piece of brisket at Wilson Farm. And I cooked it with the pickling seasoning that it comes with. My cabbage is already cooked, ready to be served. There is a little bit of um, the meat, the juice that the meat released. And I'm also sort of digging down because I also included some potatoes in here as well. Right, and those are actually, I just want to double check with the scissor. They're al dente, they're not overly mushy, but they're nice and firm to the touch. So I think for those of you who have cooked with me before, you know that I love kind of mixing up, mixing and matching my cultural background and that of my families. And as an Irish Puerto Rican family, um, you can imagine that there's certain things that we like that have more of a tropical feel to them. And one of those things is mango chutney, which I think of as a very, um, you know, it was one of those things that I think that people used in India and other parts of the world and then brought back to the different members of the British Empire because it was a way of preserving those tropical fruits. So what I'm doing is I am glazing, which basically is a very fancy word for smothering ma mango chutney all over it. There's some mango chutneys that are a little bit spicier. This one is a little bit on the sweeter side. It does have those currants in it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bake this in the oven for at 350 degrees um, while we're talking about the Irish soda bread. Okay. So that oven has been heating for a while. I always like to remind people that when you're using the oven, you wanna make sure that you give it ample time to heat up. It takes most conventional ovens anywhere between 25 and 30 minutes to heat up. And also another important thing is to make sure that your oven is calibrated properly. And the way to do that is to bake a boxed cake mix and see how your um, oven is reacting. If it is right on time in terms of what the box says, then chances are your oven is calibrated correctly. The other thing that you can do is you can buy very inexpensively a thermometer at the hardware store and set it in your oven. Also remember too, if you're opening and shutting the oven that your temperature is going to drop. So you really do wanna keep that oven opening and closing to a minimum when you're trying to roast or bake something. So the Irish soda bread is a great example of a recipe that has sort of evolved from its origins. The Irish soda bread, you don't usually see it with um, currants or raisins. It's often made with caraway, the traditional Irish soda breads that I saw when I traveled throughout Ireland. The other thing that's really pop popular is brown bread um, that they use a lot of. And of course, in my opinion, all of these are vehicles for one of the best products that um, they make in Ireland, and is, that's their butter. Um, their butter is absolutely exceptional. You can buy Kerrygold butter now in most places here in the United States. It has a high fat content, and it is really just a beautiful product. So what I like about the Irish soda bread is that it's a quick bread. It mean, that means that it doesn't have any yeast in it. So the typical recipes have flour. This is about four and a half cups of flour, a tablespoon of baking soda, some salt. And then we have about a cup of golden raisins. A lot of times you will see currants or black raisins. I happen to be partial to golden raisins. So that's what I use those for. I have about, um, this is about, uh, this is probably about three quarters of a stick of butter. I've cubed it and I actually, this is very cold butter. Ideally, if you wanted to make the cubes and put it in the freezer, that probably would work best. So my dry ingredients are in a bowl. I've mixed them together. Um, there's also a little bit of sugar and depending on your preference for sweetness, you can kind of mix and match the sugar level. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put these cubes of butter in and then I'm going to use my pastry cutter to cut the butter into the dough. So this is a pastry cutter. You also can do use two knives and basically make a cutting motion. Um, I could demonstrate, although these probably wouldn't be the knives that I would use to do it. You can kind of just cut through. Judy, if you wanna come in tighter on me.
So you could use the two knives, you know, that works. But I actually am going to use my pastry cutter and I'm going to use the shape of the pastry cutter, see that roundness, to kind of push through against the bowl and cut through that butter over and over again. And what I'm looking to happen is I'm looking for this to resemble a crumble. So the other key ingredient in this recipe is the buttermilk. Um, and in terms of buying buttermilk, most people, if you lived on a farm, had access to that buttermilk. You can buy it in the store. Um, there's a great product, Kate's of Maine. They make butter. They also make buttermilk. But you also can make it at home really easily. And the proportions, the recipe for that is for every cup of milk, you start off with a tablespoon of white vinegar, and then you fill up or lemon juice, the acid. You put that into a measuring cup, and then you fill up until you reach the cup mark or the eight ounce mark. So it, you start with the tablespoon and then you fill it up so that you have a cup and then you let it sit. And what you see, um, the byproduct will be that buttermilk. Buttermilk is used to make things tender. It's why we use it in pancakes, we use it in chocolate cake, and we use it in recipes like this, like you know, a, a quick bread, you could use it in a scone, and it's very easy to make that buttermilk. So what you're looking for here is I'm basically looking to see that you can sort of see the butter a little bit, but it looks like peas. This is a, a, a similar process that you might use if you were making um, any sort of pie crust. Now, I also wanna make sure that none of the butter is cut in my, is stuck in my pastry cutter. I can see that there is a little bit right there. So I'm just gonna scrape through, get that out. So if you have never seen a pastry cutter before, it's something that you can buy you know, at any baking store. I actually meant to look the other day. I think I even saw one at Market Basket, sort of in their home, their home products section. But a great source for baking products, um, King Arthur's Baking Shop, their, their website is actually really good and they have a lot of things on there. I also am going to add an egg. This is an American addition to the recipe. Um, it adds a little, bit of, a little bit more structure, a little bit more richness to the recipe. What's in the liquid measure container is my, it's one and three quarters cup of milk and I did use whole milk and I will send the recipes and I apologize that I wasn't able to get you um, those earlier in the week. So I'm gonna beat up the eggs and the buttermilk. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to add this and I'm gonna, as I'm adding it, I'm just trying to spread it all over, making sure I get all that liquid out. And I am going to use my spatula to fold the liquid in. Um, I actually had the pleasure during school vacation, and this is something that we're doing now. I'm doing um, some kids and family cooking classes during the vacation weeks. Um, I know that it's not so easy to figure out what to do with the kids given the restrictions and travel. And so I did a cooking class with, um, to celebrate, um, it was an eight year old and she was celebrating her birthday. And I was explaining um, how to fold liquids. And so what I kept telling them was like scrape, scrape, and I pull through. I'm scraping that bowl, I'm pulling through. And you can see that I'm getting that flour off the bottom of the mixing bowl. And as you can see, I'm making sure that, that mixing, the sides of that mixing bowl are nice and clear. The reason I'm pulling through that middle like that and folding over is I want to make sure that the flour is incorporated. But one thing that's really important with breads like this, and you can even see some of the bits of butter, that's totally okay. This is not something that we want to be totally smooth. We do want it, we do want it to be a little bit rough and jagged. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna incorporate my golden raisins into um, the mix. I just bought these yesterday, so they're still kind of plump and have that moisture. If for some reason you have raisins that you've had for a while and they seem on the drier side, you can plump them by soaking them in a little bit of boiled water and that'll bring back some of the moisture content. 
So I'm just giving this a really quick mix to incorporate those raisins through. And those little bits of butter that we are gonna see are gonna become little air pockets when we bake. And it's sort of a similar concept when you're making a laminated dough. So a laminated dough would be the dough that we use to make croissant. And you know what you're doing when you're making a croissant is you're making, you're basically folding the butter into the flour. And when you have those little pieces of butter interspersed, because by the time you finish doing doing the lamination. When you make a croissant, you basically have, I'm gonna use this silpat to, to describe this. So you would have the, you would have your dough and then you would take, it's about 210 grams of butter. So you would take like the block of butter and you would fold it into the dough. Then you would turn it, you would roll it out and then you would fold it again. And you would do that about six times so you end up having all of these multiple layers of the dough with little pieces of butter. And that's what gives you that, that, that when it rises and it has those little um, air pockets, those billowy air pockets in the croissant. Similar structure here with the quick bread. Similar concept too, when you're making a flaky pie crust that you have those little bits of butter and they sort of melt away and they leave those beautiful pockets of crispness and yummy flavor. So what I'm going to do now is there's several things I'm actually going to do. I'm going to show you the, the bread that I made earlier. So I did this one a little bit more free form this morning. I just scraped the dough onto the parchment paper and I baked it. Um, and you can see I made a score in the middle and I'll show you when I put it into the Dutch oven. And the reason I did this is that this is pretty dense in the middle. And you wanna make sure that by scoring the bread down the middle, and you'll see how I do it when I put it into the Dutch oven, that you're, you're allowing space for the heat to get in and bake that bread. And we'll cut this one in a minute. So what I have prepared here is a Dutch oven. Um, probably one of, uh, when people ask me about essential pieces for your kitchen, a Dutch oven is fantastic. I can use this to braise meats in, I can use it to make a sauce. It's also a wonderful vessel for baking bread. King Arthur actually has like a lovely bread recipe for the Dutch oven. Today, I'm gonna to use it as a mold for our, um, our Irish soda bread. And that will give us sort of that, this freeform version is more of what you might see traditionally if you were traveling through Ireland. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this one in the Dutch oven. And what I'll do is I will, when I send Matt the pictures, I will send a picture of this one done. Okay. So what I'm using here is a scraper. It's really, uh, a very useful tool when you're baking. I think that some of you have heard me describe, actually it's kind of funny because he was Irish, my pastry instructor at Le Cordon Bleu in London was from Ireland. Wonderful gentleman by the name of John Powers. And he used to tell us you have to think of baking like sailing. And if you start off slightly off your mark and what he meant by being off our mark when we were baking is if you weren't accurate in measuring and you weren't accurate and making sure you used all of the batter or the mix, you were gonna be slightly off. And if you start off slightly off on a sailing journey, you're never gonna re reach your destination. I'm gonna use this to spread it out a little bit, but I'm not gonna get overly concerned if it's not totally full. So I'm just kind of spreading it out. It's very thick as you can see. I'm gonna scrape this down again with my knife. And then I'm gonna use this knife to do that score in the middle. So one of the things that you have to be conscious of, the, the recipe will tell you to cook for about 45 minutes. So I'm coming through and I'm making that score. And I'm gonna score through here. So I'm basically making two lines across the middle. I wanna make sure that that one in the middle is key again. There you go. And what I'll do is I will send a finished product, a picture of the finished product of this one. 
The point that I was going to make is that this one is slightly thinner than the one that I made earlier today. So you want to be conscious of that when you are, um, when you're baking it, right? It's the same thing. Like if I had a recipe that could have been a cake and it's a cupcake, you have to give mine to the different times based on the sizing, the portions that you use. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to cut right through the middle of my soda bread. Ah, uh, look at that. So as you can see, you know, we have a nice, um, the texture of that dough. Um, you can see some of the pockets from the butter. You see it studded with the golden raisin. As I said, you could make this with currants, you could make it with black raisins. Um, the other thing too is some people like to sprinkle this with a little bit of caraway on the top. I want you to be able to see both sides of the bread. So it has a really nice bottom, like like nice, nice golden bottom. And this could be served with breakfast. You could have this with Barry's tea, very traditional Irish breakfast tea. You could serve it alongside a stew. It's really versatile. It's not overly sweet. Of course, if you wanted it to be more of a traditional sweet American bread, you could add more sugar to it. But I tend to skew towards using less sugar, especially because the raisins tend to add um, quite a bit of sweetness to it. What I'm gonna do, I have about four or five minutes left on the glaze um, for our corned beef. I'm gonna just move this back here. Because I'm gonna begin to get my plate ready, the plate that I'm gonna use to serve um, the corned beef, the boil. So I'm always very big on sharing with students that every meal that I make is far from perfect. But what I do, like my advantage is that I just keep trying again and again. And probably one of my most epic fails was the St. Patrick's Day a few years ago. We were really busy with the kids, but Mike and I really wanted to have friends over. So we invited some of our dear friends over for St. Patrick's Day. But the funny part is just by circumstance that everyone who came to this dinner happened, um, I'm Jewish and they happened to be Jewish too. So it was like this big joke that we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day with all of our Jewish friends. And corned beef is something that you really, you need to plan and you really need to give yourself some time to cook it. It's not one of these dishes that can be rushed because the cut of meat really does need to take its time in cooking so that it can be tender. And I totally rushed the meal and it was it was, to this day, we laugh about it. My kids are like scarred from the episode. They're like, please don't make corned beef. It'll be like that night that you made that horrible corned beef. So my friends forgave me. They still come over for dinner. But I think it's important to know that every once in a while, you are going to have a miss in the kitchen. And the important thing, like anything else in life, is if you've made a mistake and something hasn't quite turned out the way you want it to, is you have to get back up and you have to try it again. So I've kind of come back from my corned beef disaster um, and I'm, I live to tell the tale as did my guests. So what I have in this pouch is I have some of that cabbage. So one of the challenges with this meal is that it flies a little bit in the face of some of the things that I like to do because one of the things that I talk about is cooking the rainbow. So the other thing that I probably should have done is I probably could have glazed some carrots and what glazing means, it means that you sort of saute them or cook them in a little bit of butter. Um, what I might have done um, is peel the carrots and actually toss them in a little bit of honey, a little bit of honey, salt, and pepper, and just roasted them. And then I could have served them alongside um, the meal that we have today. Um, what I did was I used a half a head of cabbage. Um, each of these... Um, each of these briskets was about three or four pounds. So I used about one and a half potatoes per, and I used half a head of cabbage for each of them. So as you can see, like it's not a particularly pretty meal. So I think that we could have used a little bit more of the orange to add some color. Of course, the other thing that I could do or would do is include a slice of this yummy bread because it adds a little bit of that gold color. But as you can see, we're still kind of skewing towards um, a very yellow and sort of bland colored plate. Um, I could also um, add some greenery. Um, I could just, parsley is a very neutral herb. Um, I wouldn't be putting anything like basil or oregano. Those are not flavorings that are used commonly in British, um, rather in Irish cuisine. 
sometimes Irish cuisine gets a little bit of bad rap, but they have fantastic access to dairy products and their salmon and lamb amongst the best in the world. Um, other traditional dishes that you could be making to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, you could be making a shepherd's pie, you also could be making a beautiful lamb stew. Um, the other thing that they use a lot is they use Guinness. Um, you could use Guinness in the stew. Guinness is actually fantastic um, to use with chocolate. It's a wonderful play, uh, pairing. There's some great recipes for Guinness brownies and also Guinness chocolate cake. So I'm going to go over to our the oven right now and I am going to pull out our glazed our glazed roast, uh, our glazed corned beef. Oh, this is looking good. So any of these chutneys and the chutneys have a high sugar content. Some of the recipes that you could see for a glaze, if you like mustards and such, you could add a little bit of mustard to um, add a little bit of tang to your recipe. The other thing that you could do is you could add a little bit brown sugar. Again, if you skew towards liking the sweeter, the sweeter things. As I said, I don't like things overly sweet. Um, and I also, um, the chutney that I brought, I did buy at Wilson's Farm. It was their own, but Major Gray's does make beautiful chutney. Some of them are spicier than others. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the roast over here. I'm actually going to let it sit for a few minutes because proteins really should be allowed to sit for about five minutes before we slice into them. I'm just going to turn the timer and the oven off right here. While we're waiting for that to cool down, does anybody, or actually, let me explain. The reason I'm letting it sit for five minutes is I'm letting the proteins come back together. And this is very important when you're cooking meat. Um, you don't wanna cut into it right away because actually will be a little bit tough. So we're just gonna let it rest for a few seconds um, for five minutes while we've taken it off the heat. But while it's doing that, does anybody have any questions about anything that I've done so far? Um, uh, a couple did come in. Um, someone had asked for baking method, how long to cook? I think you had said it, but if you want to just say it again. Sure, it'd be my pleasure. So this, um, the, the free form loaf that I did, actually, you know what I'm going to, it took about 45 minutes, um, took about 45 minutes to cook. Um, but I also was using a professional grade oven that I had on the convection function. And one thing that we have not spoken about is that if you have the convection function on your oven, this bread would be a perfect recipe to use with convection, but the rule of thumb for convection is you lower the temperature by 25 degrees and you, the cooking time is usually reduced by 25%. So for example, if it said that I needed to cook something at 400 degrees, I would bake it at 375 degrees. If it said that I needed to bake it for 10 minutes, I would bake it for eight minutes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And the beautiful thing about convection when you're baking is that it circulates the air through the oven and ensures that there's a little bit more evenness. It's very similar to the concept. Think of it as the baking concept of, you know, the, the, the equal, the equivalent in baking for sous vide, right? The whole objective that we're trying to use when we're cooking something is trying to figure out how can we, how can we maintain that temperature as consistent as possible? So convection really um, is useful when you're baking because it enables you to do that. And again, too, to the extent that you have a glass window, make sure that your oven light is working. It's much better to look at your baked goods through the glass of the oven instead of opening and shutting it. Um, I, I was going to comment that, um, uh, and maybe other people can relate, but, uh, I, I like that, that the addition that you've done to the corned beef here, because like in my family, it's just kind of like you take the brined beef and then just throw it in a pot with all the vegetables. And it just, it's kind of like, a I don't know, it's, it's much more like simple, I guess, or whatever, but like, um, this is a, I, I want to try this this year actually, but um, I didn't know maybe if there was a question from that, then like, what are some of the spices that you would, uh, that, that 
people could use for when so brining many, or so many of the briskets um you know you'll see um they come with sort of a pickling pack, right? So they often have a little bit of mustard seed. Sometimes they do have a little bit of cardamom. There's a little bit of a, a vinegary feel to some of those spice packets, which is great. But in terms of the different glazes that you could use, I use mango chutney. You could use apricot, brown sugar, and mustard. That's one combination you could use. You could use red currant jelly. You could use an orange marmalade. It really is all about the flavors that appeal to you. And again, getting back to that sweet tangy combination, like we just don't like overly sweet in my family. So we tend to skew towards things that are sweet, but spicy or sweet and tangy, as opposed to just overly, overly sweet. But there's some people who I know, like they would take this Irish soda bread and they would use like, they would put like an orange marmalade on it because that's kind of what they grew up doing. So I think that some of the pickling spices that come, if you buy like a high quality, like I think that Boar's Head is a high quality company. Um, I also am able to get brisket from River Rock, the farm that um, they distribute at, they, they come to the farmer's market here in Lexington. So it's just a high quality and there's different different sort of combinations of tangy that you could get from those spice packets. And I can give some, I'll give in the recipe that I'll share with Matt and he can share with the participants. I'll send out some ideas for different spices that you could use to brine your corned beef. All right. Um, one there, other question uh, did yeah. come in if you want. Uh, just what Please. cut of corned beef do you prefer? Um, honestly, for this, for, because I, um, I smoke a lot of things too. Um, we're a big barbecue family too. So I use brisket a lot. Um, I tend to go with a flat cut, um, but I don't get overly bothered because of the way that it's cooked, the way that it's cooked. These low and slow methods of cooking really tenderize the meat. So I think it's really more about recognizing that brisket is a cut that needs time and attention right? It's something like we use, I use the sous vide also when I smoke, like I put a dry rub on it. I su actually, I sous vide that for about 24 hours, but at the lower temperature. And then I finish it on the grill by smoking it at 200 for about three hours. And it becomes, like it basically melts apart. So I think the key part is brisket is a cut of meat that needs to be cooked with time and patience, right? So Figuring out a method that works that kind of is enables you to bring in the flavors that you like is really the more important part than actually the cut. All right, so now I'm going to cut. I have some very excited parents today because I called my father and see I'm barely putting any pressure on that corned beef and it's kind of cutting right through and that's what we're looking for, right? Now, the beautiful thing about the corned beef, I love hash. So whatever we don't eat with our Irish boil with this dinner will then be sort of cut into smaller pieces and tossed with either potatoes, Brussels sprouts, and it'll be the basis for breakfast or brunch this coming weekend. So that's my tribute to the Emerald Isle. Are there any other questions? That looks fabulous. Um, oh, good. Feel, feel free to uh, add any questions to the Q and via the Q and A button. If anybody's so interested. So I have a very very happy father. He's coming at eleven thirty to eat lunch at the end today, and here's his lunch. While we're waiting for other questions, I just want to take an opportunity to tell everyone a little bit about what we're what we're up to this spring at the inn. We're continuing to do cooking classes in person. If you have kids that are on school break, either in March, if they go to private school or coming up in April, we are doing this cooking together concept that you can come and stay with your family overnight. Um, and you'll, it'll include three cooking classes. So you arrive midday and then we'll do lunch. We'll do a little historical ice cream tour of Lexington. So a little bit of history, lots of ice cream. Then we'll come back and cook dinner together. And then we'll finish um, the following morning by cooking breakfast. And that's something that we're doing one family at a time. So if you have grandchildren or children that you'd like to bring and have a little staycation here in Lexington, we would love to have you.
We're accepting reservations for Easter brunch as well as Mother's Day brunch. They're both four course menus that are meant to celebrate the holiday. And as always, our menus are available to go eat in, we have tables on the porch, and we also have tables inside, of course, adhering to the six feet spacing restrictions that have been established by the state of Massachusetts so that we're COVID safe. But any way that you like to experience the inn, we look forward to welcoming you. So please come and check us out, either come and eat dinner, take a staycation and come and stay with us overnight at the inn, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much, Tricia. Um, seems to be no more questions, but uh, this program was recorded and will be on our YouTube page if you'd like to watch it again later and the recipes will be sent out uh, later. But uh, thank you again so much. This was really great. It looks so good. Oh, I good, Matt. I should, too bad I can't send it down to the library, right? I could just send the food <laughs> right down. All right, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a very happy St. Patrick's Day and I look forward to seeing all of you in April. Thank you. There was a, a uh, there was a comment. Um, somebody had wished that or would like to see a um, Easter Passover program. I know that we're doing. I think Mina had scheduled like pizza for, which April, is sort but... of ironic because we're. I think we're doing pizza, and I'll be celebrating Passover that week. Um, so. I, I don't know. I don't know if we'll be, I mean, I can talk, I can talk to Mina. I don't think that we'll be able to pull together Easter or Passover lessons, but if somebody is interested okay. in having an Easter or Passover lesson at the end, feel free to call. I'm happy to set up a personal lesson. We will be featuring some Eastern Passover recipes on, on my Instagram feed. I post weekly lessons so you can look there and there'll be some stuff there. And we will actually also be offering a Passover menu here at the end for the entire week of Passover. I'll be sure to share that information in the recap that I send out. Um, I call I call Easter and Passover. It's sort of the well, it's not a trifecta because it's not three. I, it's it's kind of big in our house because we celebrate it all. So there's lots of cooking that happens during that week at our house. So I certainly can share some ideas of how we celebrate both holidays. People might be sick of eating Eastern or Passover food at that point too. Pizza sounds good. Well, pizza is a perfect food to break um, to break Passover. I have a lot of friends who that's the tradition that they have is pizza is the first meal they have um, after Passover is done. <laughs> that's great. All right. Well, um, was there, did you need anything else today? Or? I'm all set. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. And it's really touching to me when people, I'm so grateful for the support that we've been given by the community. It means so much to me when people call on the phone and I'll be answering and they're placing a to-go order and they said, oh, we saw you, you know, we saw your video with the library. So I appreciate your supporting the library. We so appreciate you supporting us and please continue to support your local businesses. So hopefully we can get to the other side all together with a lot of our small businesses um, intact. So thank you. I wasn't aware of that too. I'm glad that, you know, all the connection, like people seeing it on the library or on your own Instagram page. And it's really great. It's yeah. great. It's, it, it's really, it makes it all worthwhile. So thank you. All right. Thank you again, Trisha. And I'll see you in April. Wonderful. Thanks, Matt. All right. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.